You're listening to another episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. There is a 2012 episode of Doctor Who. Now, that's the Matt Smith era Doctor Who. Is that called? Not, not our Doctor Who. Not okay, our Doctor Who. Tom no, Baker is our Doctor Who. Tom Baker is our Doctor Who, but this mm-hmm. is Middle Child's Doctor Who, Matt mm-hmm. Smith. And there's an episode in that series called The Power of Three, in which an alien invasion comes in the form of millions of apparently inert little black boxes. I remember this episode. Yeah. Uh, At first, people are shocked by them and a little fearful. What are they? Where do they come from? Then, when they just sit there and they don't do anything, people are briefly fascinated about where they might have come from. But even that soon fades. And soon, nobody cares. They're just little black boxes lying all over the place. And they sort of fade into the background noise of everyday life. Just a nuisance to be cleared away or put in a drawer or closet. And there they sit, perfectly camouflaged by their sheer, boring plainness, until they suddenly come to life. And this has been David Brooks's superpower all along. <laughs> it's his sheer, nebbishy boringness. His dull repetitiveness. He's just always there in the background of American political conversations, saying the same thing over and over again on the radio and on TV and in the New York Times, like an Old Spice commercial or Flow with the Progressive Insurance Lady. But here's the thing about incessantly repetitive cologne ads and insurance ads and pizza ads and dick pill ads. They actually work. Repetition actually works. Allow me to repeat that. (laughs) Repetition actually works. (laughs) And as many of you have noticed by now, because Blue Gal and I have been repeating it so often, the entire Beltway media has been in the business of selling both ciderism to its readers and viewers as if it were a pizza or beer or reverse mortgages. By repeating it as a mantra over and over again, dozens of times a day, every day, year after year after year. And in this phase of his career, That's all David Brooks has ever been. The same droning commercial for both ciderism being run on a loop again and again for decades. So, in 2008 comes the question, what happens if David Brooks finally gets his wish? Well, that's where we left off our story last week. Barack Obama had just been elected president of the United States And it should have been a glorious time for David Brooks because Obama was, on paper, the ideal David Brooks candidate. Obama was calm, and he was rational, and he was compassionate. He was brilliant. He taught a constitutional law class at David Brooks' alma mater. And he could quote chapter and verse from David Brooks' favorite philosopher, Reinhold Niebuhr. And he spent time, crucial, rare time courting the goodwill of conservatives like George Will, Charles Krauthammer, and David Brooks. I remember he had these gentlemen to the White House. Oh, he did, repeatedly. Very early on in his administration. uh, Brooks got like seven or eight private audiences slash interviews with with, uh, Obama over the years. And here's um, what Andrew Sullivan was writing about Obama in January of 2009, a conservative dinner that was hosted at the home of George Will. Obama Tuesday night trekked to the Chevy Chase, Maryland home of conservative columnist George Will to talk politics and get to know some of his fiercest intellectual adversaries, Charles Krauthammer, 
Bill Crystal, Larry fucking Kudlow, David Brooks, Rich Lowry, Peggy Noonan, Michael Barone, and Paul Gigo. This was during the transition, right? Yeah, this was, this this was before was, he was inaugurated. He took time to have dinner. It was either just before people. or ja- just yeah. after his inauguration because it was January yeah. 2009. Yeah. And right, right out of the box, he recognizes, I need to go to these people and have them lay down their arms. Mm-hmm. Now, Barack Obama also believed in compromise to a fault, a thing that drove a lot of us crazy. His 2004, There Is No Red America, There Is No Blue America, keynote address at the Democratic National Convention was the thing that catapulted him to national prominence, and it was a perfectly balanced ode to both siderism. Obama was open to making big budget deals with Republicans that infuriated his base, people like us. He believed in market-based solutions so much that his Affordable Care Act was a performance-based tweak to Mitt Romney's own health care system that had been up and successfully running in Massachusetts for years. Barack Obama could not have been a more perfect, civilized, centrist president if he had been assembled in a goddamn laboratory and the right hated him for it. In addition to hating him for it, you know, there were a couple of other things. (laughs) A couple other things they hated Barack Obama for. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, sounds about white. Um, So how did David Brooks, the leader of the Both Sides Do It cult, cope with the finally getting the civilized centrist president of his dreams and then seeing his party react with openly racist hatred for him by doing what Brooks has done his entire career. When faced with facts that screwed up his ideology, he just pretended it wasn't happening. Uh, what? what are you talking uh, about? I never saw that. It didn't happen in my, my frame of vision. Yeah. In late 2008, Brooks was on the now defunct Charlie Rose show. And we all know what what happened to Charlie Rose. Yes, we do. And he was baffled as to why Obama wasn't 15 points ahead. Here's what he said, quote, I think there is no doubt that Barack Obama is much more specific than John McCain. If this were about issues, Obama would be winning by 15 points. The mystery is why he's not. Big mystery. Big, big I, Yeah. Mystery. yeah. Spacing out over this mystery. Other panelists on the Charlie Rose show, like Connie Schultz and the late Michelle Norris, said that it was not a mystery at all. Here is Connie Schultz. Quote, it hurts me to say, as the child of working class people, what these people were saying. When I get email from these people, there ain't a lot of nuance. Yeah. And then Schultz again said, I think Norris, and she was talking about her co-panelist, the late Michelle Norris, makes a very important point about race. I've been writing about this because I come from the working class, and I am very troubled by some of the things I'm hearing from the working class. And of course, she means white people. She means white people. She sure as hell does. Yep. Yep. I'm very troubled by some of the things I'm hearing from the working class about race And I said, you got to go home and have the tough conversations with family members. And then finally, Schultz said this, quote, I think it's code when they say, well, we really don't know if he's a Muslim and we don't know if he's patriotic. That's all code for race. And for us to pretend that it isn't happening is irresponsible for us in the media. Yeah, she laid it right at the we kind of know people. who she's <laughs> talking to on that panel when she says that. We, we kind of do. So we jump ahead a year to David Brooks in 2009 in the New York Times. This is a year after Connie Schultz explained to him, yeah, it's about race. Well, this is David Brooks, quote, well, I don't have a machine for peering into the souls of Obama's critics so I can't measure how much racism there is in there. But my impression is that race is largely beside the point. Boom. So apparently David Brooks missed all of those Tea Party rallies where there were signs about lion Africans and African lions and Muslim this and Muslim that and pictures of Barack Obama with a bone through his nose, etc. Yeah, we should make clear that David Brooks's idea 
of his political party that he's supposed to be an expert about comes from his colleagues like Charles Krauthammer and George Will and things he learns riding the quiet train on the Acela Corridor. David right. Brooks never knew shit about his own party. Anyway, please continue. Yes. So let's jump ahead another year. Now, the, it, now David Brooks has had years to observe this now. Another year to this exchange between Brooks and E.J. Dion on Meet the Press. E.J. Dion, David Brooks is sitting right there <laughs> in the same room. Look, says E.J. Dion, there is a concerted conservative campaign on the part of the movement, the minority of the movement, to use race to split people. Glenn Beck says Obama has a, quote, deep-seated hatred for white people, unquote. J. Christian Adams, a Republican activist pushing this new Black Panthers story. Oh, I says, remember that. Remember, remember that? that? Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Says the Obama Justice Department is motivated by a, quote, lawless hostility toward equal enforcement of the law, unquote. Now, there are people playing with this racial politics out there. I am not saying the NAACP certainly isn't saying that this is the whole conservative movement or most of the conservative movement or most of the Tea Party, but it is part of the strategy and people should condemn it. Of course, as it turned out, that it, of course, it turned out that it was pretty much the whole conservative movement yep. <laughs> and certainly the overwhelming majority of the GOP base. But let's leave that aside for now and move on to Mr. Brooks' reaction on this show, sitting in this room with E.J. Dion. First, he rolled out his trademark, liberals are just as bad in the opposite way thing. David Brooks said, there are liberals who call conservatives racist as a matter of tactics, too. Then, Brooks extrapolated on his single jog-by observation of a fake Tea Party rally and a Black family reunion going on near each other. Since that event did not end in a riot, Brooks concluded that the Tea Party was the goddamn salt of the goddamn earth, the best kind of people and not at all racist. And that is the context here. Here's what I wrote about this phenomenon back in July of 2005. This is during the depths of the Bush administration, when even whispering such things was heresy. And the reference here to Captain Obvious was to Tom Friedman, who you should all know by now, but applies to the entire Beltway press. And here I am back in 2005. According to the Beltway media, the universe is carefully divided into conservatives who are wrong and liberals who are somehow mysteriously and equally wrong all the time in equal numbers on every issue. And only Captain Obvious, frolicking across the few lonely yards of sand on his Isle of Reasonableness, can see the truth. It does not matter how many millions of miles the Shining Path Republicans drag the middle ground to the right. It doesn't matter that the party of Lincoln is now infested, crotch to crown, with maggoty segregationists. It does not matter that Nixon looks like a fucking socialist compared to the positions now being advocated by the GOP today. However far into the Armageddonist abyss the wingnuts charge, Captain Obvious will dutifully pace off half the distance back towards where the left is. This is a group formerly known as Rockefeller Republicans. Wherever they happen to be that day, drive his little stake into that shifting ground and declare that this is where the treasure of comity and reasonableness is buried and that everyone on either side of his little islet is equally and oppositely wrong. This is what we noticed about centrism and both siderism during the earliest days of the liberal blogosphere. And all the years and years later, that centrism and both siderism being preached by the media is exactly the same as the centrism and both siderism they were preaching 17 years ago because centrism and both siderisms are not principled ideas or coherent theories. They are mathematical functions describing a position which no human being can ever actually achieve because the Beltway media's conception of centrism is merely the exact midpoint between where the psycho GOP and the normal Democrats happen to be on any given day. So the GOP figured out that the preservation of the both sides do it lie had become so important to the commercial interests of the mainstream media 
and to the ideological imperatives of conservatives like David Brooks that however far they galloped into crazy town, men like Brooks would move that ideal centrist midpoint that much further to the right and use their media clout to dismiss any facts that contradicted that fairy tale. It is no coincidence that in 2010, that was the year that the No Labels Centrism Snake Oil Factory was launched. And David Brooks gave the keynote at its inaugural event and went on to serve on their board. And for the record, two days after they launched this scam, I wrote a long post entitled Dead Center. Political cowardice now has its own movement that accurately predicted pretty much everything this collection of political losers and out-of-work Bush administration flunkies would turn out to be. And it was completely a well-heeled cover-up for the Bush administration. Absolutely. Yep. That's all it was. And it's and it's alive and well today. Mm -hmm. During the balance of the Obama administration, the GOP made it painfully and publicly clear that their only priority was crippling and destroying the Obama administration by any means necessary. The base, who had gradually forgotten to pretend to be independents, were thrilled by the Republicans' burn it all down and blame the black guy strategy. And because the preservation of the both sides do it lie had become indispensable to both the mainstream media and respectable conservatives like David Brooks, they all settled into a strategy of ritually blaming Obama for every act of GOP premeditated sabotage because he didn't compromise more or lead better. Why won't Obama lead? Why won't he lead? Why won't he go out for drinks with Mitch McConnell? For Republicans, it was perfection. Every time they blew something up, Obama would get the blame. Every time Obama offered an olive branch and pulled back a bloody stump, it was also Obama's fault because whatever. Because he didn't wear his flag pin. Because he put his shoes up on the desk. Because he was too uppity. Have you seen his scary wife? They mocked him when he asked for civility and were rewarded for it. They laughed at him when he wept for murdered children and were rewarded for it. What the media was doing was concretizing a prime directive in which the both sides do it lie must be preserved at any cost, which in turn was creating a permanent permission structure in which Republicans would be allowed to get away with murder with no consequences. Now mm -hmm. think about where that leads us today. We will get to more of that, but just think about that. Think about the, a the fact that permanent this is a permission structure in which Republicans are allowed to get away with murder with no consequences. Yeah, this is a decade ago. This is mm -hmm. before Trump ever shows up. Yep. And by April of 2012, it was so bad and so dangerous that Sober-minded, respected Washington, D.C. political analysts Norm Ornstein and Thomas Mann dared to publish a column in the Washington Post entitled, Let's Just Say It, The Republicans Are the Problem, for which they were all but blackballed for saying out loud what everybody already damn well knew but refused to talk about. It was the most read op-ed at the Washington Post in years. Yep. And most emailed. Everybody in D.C. read it. Everybody in D.C. nodded to it, and then no one had him on the, them on the Sunday shows nope. or any other talk show to talk about it. Nope, because, you know, they had attacked the church, the state yep. religion of the Beltway, uh, Beltway media. Both sides do it. At the time, columnist Dan Frumkin wrote how the mainstream media press bungled the single biggest story of the 2012 campaign. Quote, fearful of appearing biased, the elite political press failed to call sufficient attention to the Republican Party's radical agenda and disdain for facts. The result is that, in the name of balance, the press actually put its thumb on the scale and prevented a true reckoning. In December of 2012, same year, the Washington Post Jonathan Bernstein got at what really happened and the context that we are talking about a decade later. This is from him in the Washington Post. Where the press failed in 2012. That is, after decades of carefully building a reputation for seriousness and scholarly expertise, Mann and Ornstein were basically blackballed by the press. Well, not quite. They were instead reclassified. 
They were no longer serious and scholarly neutral arbiters, but were suddenly treated by the press as democratic shills. And that's the problem, because the conventions of the press do not allow neutral observers to conclude what, to many political scientists, is an inescapable truth. There was something seriously wrong with the Republican Party. Now, this is, this is me talking now. This is one of the most useful features of the both sides do it lie. Anyone who challenges the lie of both sides do it orthodoxy, whether they are dirty hippie liberal bloggers or sober-minded respective political analysts, get shoved into the extremes on both sides ghetto where they can be safely ignored. In 2012, we found David Brooks wringing his hand and proclaiming himself a sap because Barack Obama ran for re-election as a savvy, democratic politician and not an Edmund Burke plush toy. In 2013, Brooks was in maintenance mode, dutifully patrolling the perimeter of the both sides do it fortress, blaming Congress for shutting the government down and not passing immigration reform instead of the Republicans who shut the government down and the Republicans who had sabotaged immigration reform. It's always the problem in Washington, Drift Class. Isn't it weird how it's always just Washington? Washington, Washington did this, system? yes. Yeah. Blaming Barack Obama for much of it, quote, because the president has not gathered a governing majority at any point in his presidency, some 60-vote majority that he can count on time and time again. This was Barack Obama's fault that he didn't have 60 senators in the Democratic Party. It's his or, fault. <laughs> or 10 or 15 reasonable Republicans who right, could govern from the center. Right, to bust the filibuster that, yeah. that Mitch McConnell was abusing left, right, and all over the place. Okay. Mm -hmm. By this point, the lie that Obama was somehow to blame for the GOP losing its mind and smashing everything it could lay its hands on had become so flagrant that even mild-mannered Ezra Klein was moved to write about it in a Washington Post article entitled is the Republican Party Obama's fault? It's a long piece, mostly ripping the Washington Post's own David Brooks clone, Michael Gerson, for advancing this batshit idea that, quote, the White House's plan then is to force Republicans to be unreasonable by being reasonable and taking the positions Obama has espoused all along, including in the 2012 campaign. Ezra Klein continues, Another version came today from New York Times columnist David Brooks. The column takes the form of Brooks imagining the internal monologue of a White House strategist who's developing a strategy to destroy the Republican Party. And what was that sinister strategy? Ezra Klein explains. So White House officials' devious plan to destroy the Republican Party, in Brooks's view, is that they will propose more moderate popular policies than they did in their first term, thus making Republicans look terrible when they vote against everything. That monster, that monster Obama. Does that Obama. sound familiar to you? Oh, oh, hell yeah. This is uh, Charlie Sykes' whole predicate. It's that <laughs> liberals calling Republicans racist made them racist, so it really wasn't their fault. Yeah. And doing popular shit is is mean. It's unfair. It's totally unfair. And unfair. <laughs> right. Because you force Republicans to vote against things like Medicare and Social Security by yeah. being for them. Is this crazy, completely indefensible? Sure it is. And remember, this is just 2013. And this bullshit was already coming from every corner of the Beltway media. So let's jump to 2014 when David Brooks has coined a new ism to explain why the Republican Party was clearly off its rocker without blaming, you know, the Republican Party. To Bushism and Delayism and Gingrichism, David Brooks added the term partyism because the mere existence of political parties was the reason the GOP was a racist madhouse. And the Beltway's very serious people glommed on to partyism almost overnight. Nobody remembers this anymore, but man, they love that term because it involves blaming both sides. 2014 was also the year when Brooks's colleague, Paul Krugman, very gently called David Brooks a lying asshole in the New York Times in a column entitled The Invisible Moderate. This is Paul Krugman now. 
I actually agree with a lot of what David Brooks says today, but you know there has to be a but. So does a guy named Barack Obama. Which brings me to one of the enduringly weird aspects of our current political discourse. Constant calls for a moderate, sensible path that supposedly lies between the extremes of the two parties, but is in fact exactly what Obama has been proposing. So David Brooks says the following, the federal government should borrow money at current interest rates to build infrastructure, including better bus networks, so workers can get to distant jobs. The fact that the federal government has not passed major infrastructure legislation is mind-boggling, considering how much support there is from both parties. Paul Krugman again. Well, the Obama administration would love to spend more on infrastructure. The problem is that a major spending bill has no chance of passing the House. And that's not a problem of both sides. It's the GOP blocking it. Exactly how many Republicans would be willing to engage in deficit spending to expand bus networks? Remember, these are people who consider making rental bicycles available an example of totalitarian rule. Back to me again. 2014 was also the year when David Brooks cheerfully announced that the GOP had fully detoxified itself of Palinism. And now it was just kicking all kinds of ass. There was nothing but blue skies and an unlimited future ahead. In 2015, David Brooks circled back to drawing on and on and on about how both parties suck, and he began pitching the idea of a super awesome centrist party where all the cool kids could hang out and do centrist stuff. But don't worry, because in 2015, David Brooks said Donald Trump's just a joke. He has no chance of winning, and anyway, Bernie Sanders is just as bad, maybe worse. Now, are you starting to see a pattern here? But once it became clear, that the threat from Donald Trump was real, that the both sides do it lie wasn't holding back the tide anymore, and that the base of David Brooks's own party was rallying to Trump because they loved his sadism and his lies and his unvarnished racism. Someone in authority appears to have had a blunt, unpleasant conversation with Mr. Brooks about his future in the media because he had fucked up so consistently and so very, very publicly on the pages of the New York Times. So once again, we now return to the now defunct Charlie Rose show in 2015, where hacks like Brooks were always guaranteed the gentlest treatment. Remember the last time we saw Brooks on that program was 2008, closing his eyes to the very, very visible racism happening in the GOP right in front of him. So now we're in 2016. Charlie Rose says, so do you think you were wrong that you somehow had been on the Acela too much and not done what? And Brooks says, as I say, I'm out in the country. Every week I'm somewhere, but somehow I didn't see it coming. I'm, I'm, I'm not alone in that. A lot of us didn't see it coming. And Charlie Rose replies, oh, I don't know anybody that saw it coming. And Brooks kind of smirks and laughs and says, yeah, I'm sure there are some people claiming they did, but you know. And then he just trails off. And right there, you can see the context for the next iteration of the Beltway common wisdom being set in concrete. And that's the following. Since no one saw this coming, and since everyone failed equally, no one is guilty. No one is to blame. And as long as we all agree to pretend that all those extremist liberal bloggers who have been warning about these conditions within the GOP for decades simply don't exist, and as long as Brooks promises to do a little painless penance, to journey into the heart of the American darkness and compare notes on Edmund Burke with shit shovelers in Nebraska and pawnbrokers in Kansas, everything will be cool. Everything will be fine. Teach a Everyone... college course on humility. Sure, at Yale. And that'll do it. Yeah, not at, not at some Aggie college in the middle of America, <laughs> no. but Yale. <laughs> Yale. <laughs> at this point, because, you know, everyone's off the hook and no one's to blame, everyone can now return safely to their default setting and no one will lose their jobs just because events had shown that they never had the slightest fucking idea what they were talking about. Yep. During the next few months, David Brooks would write about the impossibility of Trump actually being nominated, how the party establishment would rally to stop him, how it was definitely going to be Rubio. He wrote a column which repeatedly linked Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump as equally terrible. Trump and Sanders, Sanders and Trump, 
for 14 paragraphs. And when Bernie lost, Brooks simply pivoted to writing about how Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were equally sinister and untrustworthy. Trump's convention speech was the perfect embodiment of the politics of distrust. And Clinton's basket of deplorables riff comes from the same spiritual place. And on and on like that, because protecting the both sides do it lie was still the prime directive. And since it was inconceivable to establishment hacks like Brooks that Donald Trump could actually win, it was perfectly safe to go on savaging Hillary Clinton through the primaries, through the campaign, through the election, through her inauguration, and through her first term, because she would not be a legitimate president because she ran against Donald Trump. Right. And it was... and So that's not a real, that's not a mandate for anything. And, and these people were all, all of them were burnishing their resumes as tough truth tellers for the Clinton presidency. Mm-hmm. Look, we mm-hmm. beat the crap out of her, so you can trust us when it comes to politics. Right. In fact, since Hillary was definitely going to win, there was nothing ahead but glorious and prosperous days. For David Brooks, the both sides do it lie, and all of Brooks' imitators like Matthew Dowd and Ron Fournier and Michael Gerson and on and on. And then all those previous decades of the Beltway media pretending the base of the GOP wasn't racist or paranoid or brainwashed by Fox News, all those decades of training Republicans that they could get away with anything with no consequences, and all those decades of endlessly repeating to the general public that there was no difference between the two parties came to a head, because that's when the bad thing happened. Which we will dive right into on the next episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff. Thanks for listening to this third warm-up episode on David Brooks. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback and some suggestions about tweaks to the format. Keep your comments coming. We love to get your ideas. Our plan is to do a couple more of these before the end of 2022. And then if we have enough Patreon donors to do these every week on Tuesdays, in addition to our regular Thursday show. Don't forget, we're still looking to get 300 Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional Left Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.